Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Midweek Bible Study. My name is Hubert Cunningham, and I'm the pastor here at Pennington United Methodist Church. Well, we've got to Holy Week, a very important and special and significant week in the life of Christ our Lord. And as we think about how he spent his last week on earth, uh, we remember some of those events. For example, last Sunday we celebrated Palm Sunday, where Jesus made his triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem. Uh, that's recorded in Mark chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. Uh, we then realized on Monday that Jesus cursed the out-of-season fig tree for not having any figs. Well, that seems rather odd that, that Jesus would do such a thing as that, until we realized that Israel was uh, symbolically portrayed as the fig tree. And what he was saying is that Israel is spiritually bankrupt, and there's got to be something that happens dramatic that changes the course of human history and offers salvation. That's in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Then on Tuesday, we find that Jesus is now going to the Mount of Olives, uh, across uh, from the holy city of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley. And it's really just a, a valley that's between a hill that Jerusalem sets on and the Mount of Olives. And uh, while he is there on the Mount of Olives on Tuesday of that particular week, uh, he was debating the religious leaders. Uh, he was teaching parables. He was healing the sick. Some of the more significant uh, parables that Jesus taught that week was the ten virgins, the ten talents, uh, the good and wicked servants, and things of that nature. Very busy day in the life of our Savior. Then on Wednesday, he visited uh, the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus there in Bethany. And uh, he uh, uh, was anointed by Mary with the perfume. You remember that uh, the perfume... Uh, was spilled on his uh, feet, and Mary was uh, uh, wiping his feet with her hair, and Judas uh, kind of scorned Jesus and said, just think how much money that perfume cost, and if we'd have taken that money and we'd have given it to the poor, how much good it would have done. Of course, uh, Judas's motives was not pure. He would have kept the money for himself, but that's what happens. And then later on that Wednesday, Jesus is betrayed, by Judas for some 30 pieces of silver. And then on Thursday, Thursday, Jesus shares the Passover meal with his disciples. He brings them into the upper room. There he uh, tries to understand what's going on. Uh, he knows that Judas is going to betray him. He knows that Peter is going to deny him. And the remaining disciples will desert him. He is hoping that they will understand that he is going to be the sacrifice to redeem people from their sins. And so he takes the elements that is on the, the table for the Passover meal, and he takes a couple of them, and he helps them to understand that his body is going to be broken, and his blood is going to be shed. And so he institutes the Lord's Supper on that evening. And then on Friday, Jesus is, uh, is crucified on the cross after he has went through a mockery of a trial before the Sanhedrin and then before Pilate, and uh, he is flogged and beaten, and now he is on the cross where he will die. And that is what we call Good Friday. And of course then on Saturday, uh, Jesus is in the tomb before the resurrection takes place on Sunday. Tonight, I want us to look at uh, the uh, crucifixion, and I want us to uh, hear the words from God's Word as He teaches us about this event. Uh, it was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified Him. The inscription of the charge against Him read, The King of the Jews. And with Him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Ah, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. And come on down from the cross. 
In the same way, the chief priest, along uh, with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land, and there in the afternoon, at three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders heard it. They said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come and take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the curtains of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last breath, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Mark chapter 15, verses 25 through 39. Well, the Romans practiced crucifixion as a means of striking fear in the hearts of people. And they did so for some 800 years. Silenza, who is one of the historians, said that if you knew there was a likelihood you would be arrested and crucified, it would be better for you to commit suicide. Josephus, the Jewish historian, said, It is the most pitiful of all deaths. Crucifixion was an extremely effective deterrent since crucifixion took place along the main thoroughfares where many people would see what was happening. The vertical beam of the cross was left in place at the site, and the criminal, after they were flogged and severely beaten, uh, carried the cross beam, which would weigh now probably over a hundred pounds. Uh, after they were beaten now, and after they were severely beaten, they were, they were beaten to the point that they were given only enough strength to carry that cross beam to the cross. And victims were tif- typically left hanging, uh, or their bodies were taken down and left on the ground near the cross until animals would finish eating them. Some of their bodies were placed on trash heaps. The bones simply may have been scattered unless loved ones come to claim them. But in this particular situation, in Jerusalem, people had the opportunity to bury their dead. But the goal, and I want you to hear this because this is incredibly important, the goal of crucifixion was to inflict the maximum agony for the longest period of time. Torture you until death, but drag it out and make it as long as they possibly could. Now that's the kind of death that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ experienced on the cross. And that's why it's such a big deal. You say, well, what did the the crucifixion of Christ on the cross accomplish? Well, it accomplished atonement which is a theological word. It just means that we are made at one with God. We are aligned with Him. Our sins are forgiven. That's the simplest way I know to describe it. Our sins are forgiven and because of the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross. Now, I can tell you that there is no possible way that I or any theologian can uh, explain the doctrine of atonement, and how it works when Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins. We can testify to the fact that there was a Savior who came and died on the cross, and because of that, we have eternal life. We are forgiven of our sins. We have new life in Christ. But theologians uh, like to theorize about things. They like to come up with ideas about things. And so some of the ideas that they've come up with about why Jesus died on the cross and what that accomplished by forgiving us of our sins is called the substitutionary theory of atonement. 
Now what the substitutionary theory of atonement means, it's mean that Jesus uh, is seen as taking our place on the cross. We have sinned. We should have went to the cross. We should have been crucified. We should have received the punishment. But He took our place. He took the pain, the suffering, the agony, the hell for our sins. That's the substitutionary theory of atonement. We talked a little bit last week about the moral influence theory that the suffering and death of Jesus demonstrated the depth of our human sin. Uh, it required something severe, something really major in order to cover our sins. But it also gives to us an idea about the breadth of God's love in a way that is supposed to move us to repentance and give us a deep desire to follow God. In other words, it should make us sick to our stomach that God would have to experience through Christ the pain, the agony that He experienced on the cross, the suffering, the human torture. And because of that, because of we're being sick to our stomach over what He did for us, we repent of our sins and follow Christ. For example, it's the same kind of idea that we would see when we visit the Holocaust Museum in Israel, we see the pain, the suffering that the Jewish people went through, and we say to ourselves and resolve within our being, this will never happen again. Well, I want to talk to you tonight about another uh, theory of atonement. This is the sacrificial offering theory, and we know that we go all the way back to Genesis 4, and we see that human beings are bringing sacrificial offerings to God. They're bringing things like grain and animals and wine and oil and monetary gifts. Human beings are offering these things as expressions of gratitude, devotion, love, and most of all, worship. In bringing those offerings, believers believe that they are united with God. It's like when we worship on Sunday morning. And we have the opportunity to give our tithes and offering into the storehouse of faith. We are not doing that to buy our salvation or make our relationship right with God. We're just doing it as an act of worship. And we're saying by doing this, we are united with God. Now sacrificial gifts were also a way of expressing sorrow and repentance. And some of us may have used some sacrificial gifts to express our sorrow or repentance. For example, when you hurt someone, perhaps even your spouse, we will want to acknowledge our transgressions, we want to say, I'm sorry, and then we ask for forgiveness. But we, we realize that we really want to make sure that our spouse understands that we're serious, we're sincere about being sorry, and, and we realize that we've hurt them and we love them, and so we may want to give them a gift, or maybe write them a note, or some other expression that says, I'm sorry, I realize I hurt you, and I am sincerely sorry for my actions. So that's what uh, sacrifices do. Now, in the Hebrew community, they have a Day of Atonement. It's usually in September. It's called Yom Kippur. Uh, the priest alone on this day would go into the Holy of Holies, and offer a sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. He would go into the Holy of Holies and he would make this sacrifice of, of a lamb. And, and as he was sacrificing the lamb on the altar, he would say something like this. God, it's with this blood I offer this sacrifice. A living creature dying that you might forgive your people. I come on their behalf. I am pleading with you to forgive their sins and remember their sins no more. Now, the priest would take the second uh, animal, usually a goat, and uh, he would place the sins of the people on it. Uh, it was called a scapegoat. And uh, it would be uh, one that was sent away from the dwellings where people lived, 
into the wilderness, never to be seen again. And as this happened, the people came to understand just as the uh, animal had went away, never to be seen again, their sins were forgiven, never to be remembered again. And Jesus talked about that uh, in the scripture. He talked about our sins or as far as, uh, as the east is from the west. He talked about the fact that they're buried in the sea to be remembered no more. When the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin and all unrighteousness, it makes it right with God and we are forgiven. Now, I think that all of these theories, all of these ideas about atonement are certainly true. I do believe that Jesus was our sacrificial gift, that he took our place on the cross, that we should have been crucified. I believe in the moral influence theory that uh, when we look at the cross and look at the fact that Jesus suffered so severely and was tortured so severely for our sins that should make us sick to the stomach so that we realize that we want to repent. We don't want to cause that kind of pain, that kind of suffering. And we want to follow God. And I also believe in, in sacrifice, which is really a way of offering worship to God and praise and thanksgiving. So maybe all of these theories are right. The main thing that I know is that as a sinner, I am saved by a Savior who went to the cross, gave himself for my salvation. That's the simplest way I know to express it. It's much more understandable for me than trying to explain the doctrines of atonement and all of that. I don't believe that God came up with theories of atonement. I believe he just screams at us, I love you, I care about you, and I want to forgive you of your sins. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Now, as we think about the cross, there are several things that's going to happen uh, here in this sanctuary uh, this week. Uh, Thursday evening, tomorrow evening, we're going to have our Monday Thursday service. It'll be a time for us to remember how Jesus brought his disciples into the upper room, uh, shared that meal with them, the Passover meal, and instituted the Lord's Supper. Uh, the key word for tomorrow evening as we worship will be remember. And we need to remember what Christ does. Now, not just to remember so we can recall it, but we need to remember it because it will make a profound difference in the way we respond to Christ. So we're going to do that tomorrow evening in this sanctuary. I hope you'll come at 7 o'clock and be with us. And then on Friday evening, it's Good Friday, and we're going to have a tenebrae service, which means that we go from light to dark, and we're going to remember the seven words of Christ on the cross of Calvary, really the seven phrases of Christ on the Calvary. I'm, I'm going to review those for you in just a minute, but that's what we're going to do, and it will help us to remember the sacrifice that Christ made. I, I'm afraid what happens many times is that we come on Sunday, uh, Palm Sunday, and we, we join in the celebration, the waving of the palm branches, the shouting of Hosanna. And it, it's a celebration. It's, it's almost like a party because we're, we're recognizing that, that our Lord is making a triumphal entry as he goes up into the city of Jerusalem, the holy city, the capital city. It's, it's a high moment. And then we come back on the next Sunday, and it's Easter Sunday, and we're celebrating the great resurrection, and the tomb is empty, and Jesus has defeated death, hell, and the grave, and it's a time of celebration, and it should. It's full of joy and jubilance. But we realize that somewhere between Palm Sunday and Easter, there was an incredible amount of suffering and pain because Jesus suffered for us and gave us the opportunity to experience salvation. So that's the reason why we do Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, and maybe a Wednesday night Bible study, is to remind us of the tremendous price that Christ paid for our salvation. Now I want to just briefly look at those seven expressions that Christ uttered on the cross. You know when you're dying, the last words are very important. You know, you just think about it. If you knew that these were the last words you were ever going to speak, you would carefully consider them. You, you would not probably want to say something that was mean or hurtful or negative, but you'd probably want to reassure your family how much you love them and care for them. You'd probably want to say something about what you valued the most. Uh, and, and, and certainly, as we look into the heart of Christ, we, we hear that, we see that, 
We experience that in these seven phrases on the cross. In John 19, 27, he says, here is your mother. The cross is probably about two to three feet off the ground. Uh, that Jesus' feet, he's looking right down at his mother by the beloved disciple John, and, and he is saying to, to John, here is your mother. Take responsibility for her. Go with her. Watch over her. I am not going to be with her now, so I'm giving her to you to take care of. So he's taking care of his mother. And then Luke chapter 23, verse 34, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. He is actually forgiving. This is the great act of love. He is forgiving those that are torturing him so severely. And he's offering to them forgiveness. Forgive them. They're not even asking for it. They're not even wanting it. But Jesus is forgiving them to kind of help you understand the nature of what he was about, what he was doing. He was forgiving even his enemies. He did not die just for his friends. He died for his enemies as well. And then in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, we discover that Jesus is on the cross between two thieves. Uh, one of them is heckling him, and the other is a little sympathetic and saying, wait a minute, don't, don't heckle him. We're guilty of our sins. We should be crucified, but he is innocent. We shouldn't do that. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. And then in Matthew 27, 46, Jesus simply says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Meaning that he believes that even in this hour, it's a lonely hour, even God himself has deserted him, turned his back on him because the pain and suffering is so severe. And then in John chapter 19, verse 28, he says, I am thirsty, revealing the human thirst that he is experiencing. And then in Luke chapter 23, 46, he says, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. He is saying, I give up. I, I'm expressing faith in you. You receive my spirit. And then in John chapter 19, Verse 30, we hear those last words. It is finished. It's over. His mission has been accomplished. His life has been sacrificed. He will go to the tomb, but he will rise again in victory over death, hell, and the grave, over sin, that we might have salvation. Well, I hope you'll uh, make every effort to be a part of the worship service Tomorrow evening, as we gather, uh, we want to remember what happened in that upper room. We'll talk about it. Uh, I hope it will move you to remember the significance, the cost uh, of your salvation. And realize that it's not just uh, a trivial thing that Christ died for your salvation, but it, it is something that is of supreme significance. And then on uh, Friday, remember the cross the seven phrases that Christ uttered from the cross. We'll go into those more in depth. And then on Sunday morning at 1030, we'll gather in this sanctuary in person. We were not able to do that last year because of the virus. We were not able to have a Monday, Thursday or Good Friday service because of the virus. But this year, thanks be to God, we're going to be able to gather and we're going to worship and we're going to give God praise and thanksgiving. And Sunday, Easter Sunday, is going to be a day of celebration a day of joy, a day that will uh, truly celebrate the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who gives to us victory over death, hell, and the grave. I want us to approach the uh, Lord tonight in prayer, and let's ask Him to watch over us and help us during this holy season of Lent. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we come to a week that is different from all other weeks, a time when we survey the cross, the significance of the cross, and your obedience to go to the cross, and your suffering. Oh God, we recognize tonight that your experience on the cross was physically uh, of, a, of a emotional, I mean, serious pain. And we, we praise you because you was willing to die for us and offer yourself as sacrifice. But as we think about the events of Holy Week, we remember that it's not only a physical pain that you experience, 
but that you experience an emotional pain as you were rejected by your disciples, by the religious authorities, and even your closest friends and allies. We know that not only were you uh, severely suffering for our sins physically and emotionally, but even on the cross, you suffered spiritual abandonment when even God himself turned his back on you. Oh God, we cannot offer praise and thanksgiving that would be significant, but we pray that you will help us in this hour to trust you, follow you, and serve you to the very best of our ability. I pray for those that are sick. I pray for those that grieve. I pray for those that are apart from you and need salvation. May you help us all to follow and serve you to the very best of our ability. Thank you, O oh God. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Well, I hope that you'll be with us on Sunday and worship with us. I hope that this will be a season of spiritual renewal for you and that it will be a blessing. I, I can't help but just draw attention to our altar uh, scape. Uh, it is all prepared for uh, the Thursday evening service. Uh, we're ready. You see the three crosses there. And uh, I hope that you'll come and worship with us as we prepare ourselves to go to the cross for Christ. May God bless you and take care of you. Amen.